All right. We'd like to uh, welcome everybody to our Midday at the Oasis webinar today. Uh, my name is Kelly Hamm. I am the Community Engagement Librarian at NNLM Pacific Southwest Region. And uh, today's webinar is Citizen Science Day 2019, Add Real Scientific Research to Your Library Programming. Today is February 20th, 2019, and um, we're very happy to bring this webinar to you today. Uh, I'm going to go to our next slide. Oops, sorry, wrong one. All right, so we're, we're just about to get started. Uh, today our presenters are Darlene Cavalier, who is from the School for the Future of Innovation in Society at the Arizona State University and also with SciStarter. Dan Stanton with um, Arizona State University and SciStarter also, and Pietro Michelucci, and I hope I pronounced your, your name correctly. Um, Pietro, he is the Executive Director of the Human Computation Institute. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Darlene Cavalier. Go ahead, Darlene. Thank you for the introduction, Kelly. And it's wonderful to be here. I am calling in from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I'm based in Philly, and I um, spend a lot of time in Arizona, um, where I work mostly with citizen science and more and more with citizen science through libraries. Thank you so much to Kelly and NNLM Pacific Southwest region for um, making it possible for us not just to talk about and share these resources, but to develop them and make them um, sustainable in, in lieu of all the pro programs that we're doing to help really support libraries as community hubs for citizen science. Okay. So we know through this work that libraries absolutely can become hubs and help connect everyday people to real science they can do. And we emphasize the real science in the sense that we are aware that there are wonderful STEM programs, science, technology, and engineering and math programs offered through libraries. The distinguishing factor with citizen science is that citizen science actually advances research. And I'll give you some examples. Here's some of the work that we're currently doing with libraries, primarily in Maricopa County, Arizona. We're working with six public libraries right now you could walk into these libraries and actually find some citizen science kits in circulation. Here's some examples of what's in those kits. And you can see these are cards that patrons would find at the library and take to the, um, take to the reference desk to, ask to check out a kit. One of the kits helps people measure light pollution, and it includes a dark sky meter. Another one helps patrons search for zombies, B-E-E. -E. These are otherwise healthy um, honeybees that have been infected by flies. It's a light trap in that kit. And the other one allows people to explore biodiversity by using clip-on magnifying glasses that are ideal for mobile devices and tablets, and then uploading that information to different apps, including a naturalist. You can learn more about those projects and those kits at sitestarter.org forward slash library. We do um, a number of um, initiatives with entire school districts. For example, Broward County School District um, offers citizen science to their middle schools as part of their project-based learning. And through SciStarter, they're able to help guide and track the progress of students who have been assigned different projects. And then at the district level, the district gets to really see the collective impact that their student population has had on citizen science and research projects. And we do all that through analytics that were developed with support from the National Science Foundation. Very similar process for universities, including North Carolina State University, where all the faculty and students um, authenticate into SciStarter to find projects that have been assigned to them. And then the faculty can track the progress and support students across a continuum of engagement. We work very closely with the Girl Scouts of USA. So from a young age, 
um, most of this is to just basically demonstrate that there's a lot of different age ranges and different types of um, projects, different ways of engaging in scientific research. In this case, with the Girl Scouts, they're fairly young. They come over to SciStarter with their troops. They select projects to do together as a troop. Then they take action on those projects. And at an um, organizational level, the Girl Scouts of USA is able to see how frequently um, troops and councils are engaged in what types of projects and to better understand if that um, interest and engagement in citizen science continues even after the girls earn their badge. We do this because we care about citizen science and we care about science. Someone you know is a citizen scientist. This little um, image on the left here represents eBird. eBird is an application that enables birders in particular to organize their observations of birds that they see. And in doing so, they agree to share their data with ornithologists and other scientists. So in this case, 1.5 million reports were submitted in January alone. In the center aisle there, the center lane, you see an image with a water quality tester. These are people who volunteer to monitor our nation's rivers, streams, and lakes, and, and oceans. There are an estimated 1.5 million people who volunteer to do that. And then on the right, it's another type of citizen science. This is where people download software to basically use up your computer's spare processing time to help scientists check for signs of life out and beyond Earth. Our goal is to work with librarians to really help make research more efficient. And we do this because we know that the power of the volunteers, known as citizen scientists, absolutely advances scientific research. And there's a lot of other benefits that come as a result of being involved in citizen science projects. We have a link at the end of this um, presentation where you can find a fairly new report from the National Academies that talks more about the learning outcomes of citizen science as well and how it can be empowering as well. I'm going to toss it now to my colleague, Dan Stanton. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dan Stanton. I'm a librarian at Arizona State University. Um, and I am uh, very pleased to uh, be able to, to share some of the cool resources uh, that are that have been developed for specifically for libraries and librarians with regards to citizen science. Um, Arizona State University and, and SciStarter have been working on citizen science and libraries for a couple of years now, about a year and a half. And what you see before you is the, the soon to be available librarian's guide to citizen science. Um, and we've shared some of the resources and best practices uh, that we have found in our uh, work and uh, in partnering up with other folks. Um, so it takes you from the lessons we've learned in the past couple of years right up to Citizen Science Day 2019. And you'll see uh, that there's a lot of information about programming um, and accessing resources and overall just uh, a great guide for um, moving forward with uh, introducing your, yourself and your staff to citizen science. And this year is a big step for uh, Citizen Science Day. As you can see, this is the fifth annual Citizen Science Day uh, presented by the Citizen Science Association and SciStarter. Um, uh, I've been involved for a couple of years, and I'm, uh, it's, it's amazing to me to realize that up until a couple of years ago, I did not know what citizen science is. Uh, and so, the word has been getting out there, and it, this Citizen Science Day keeps growing every year. So this year, we're going to be celebrating the work of citizen scientists and diversity of citizen science projects around the world. And most of all, we're encouraging the public to get involved, 
and connecting people through the power of citizen science and building that sense of community through the library, which is the center of our communities. So some of the uh, resources that you'll have available to uh, introduce citizen science to your library and to your community uh, are available on the Citizen Science Day webpage from SciStarter.org. Uh, we all know that you know information is good about a project like citizen science, but uh, useful resources are even better. Uh, and there are a lot of useful resources uh, to assist you in making your uh, introduction to citizen science and, and hosting of Citizen Science Day events easier and more um, productive. Some of the things that we have are the uh, Librarian's Guide to Citizen Science that I mentioned before, uh, the SciStarter the Citizen Science Day website, um, SciStarter uh, has access to over uh, 3,000 citizen science projects. Um, and so you can uh, search for um, citizen science projects in your area or area of interest. Um, you can find what other uh, projects are going on in your area a calendar and a map. We want to make sure that you add your events on there and they will be um, out there nationally for uh, people to see and to find you. And then also a, a people finder because there are lots of people who are involved in citizen science in your area that you may not be aware of. And so uh, if you need volunteers, if you need experts, um, this is a great resource for you uh, to use. Um, it was just about a year ago uh, that we started our our um, cooperation with uh, Kelly and uh, the National Network of the Library of Medicines. Uh, in our pilot project here in Maricopa County, uh, we wanted to to host something on Citizen Science Day. We didn't have our projects down yet. Um, and so we uh, created some resources and some displays in our public libraries and asked people to uh, contribute and to discuss with us what their areas of interest were uh, for citizen science. And this is an example of one of the resources that will be available to you. You can download uh, this template and buy some post-it notes and have folks uh, let you know uh, what areas they are interested in with citizen science. And then again, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, folks behind citizen science. And so we have, uh, we're backed up and supported by professional organizations, scientists, government agencies and advocacy groups uh, which have uh, specializations and a lot of knowledge in this area. Some of these folks have been doing it for uh, quite a while uh, and it's, it's great to be able to tap into these resources uh, to help you along when you're, when you're just getting started. And lastly, the Megathon. This is it. This is what brings it all together. Uh, for this year, and we're very pleased uh, that uh, with your interest in this event. And so you can see that the Megathon uh, has a potential to bring together thousands of people uh, on a single day uh, to answer and do real research um, that could lead to um, promising results in Alzheimer's research. And I just want to point out that the the URL there uh, that we'll you'll be seeing again is megathon.us. That is that will take you to uh, the Megathon site. And uh, I am going to turn this over to Pietro, who will go into detail about the cool 
project that is the Stall Catchers Megathon. And before Pietro. we do before we oh. do that, um, I'd like to interrupt for just one second. Um, hold on one moment. I'm going to be changing a few things on our interface here. There was a question in the chat about uh, the resources, the downloading of the uh, posters and so forth. And, and right now it still says that the resources are coming soon. Can, can you say when those resources will be available? Yes, they'll be available Friday, this Friday, like two days. Okay. Great, and um, and I hope it's okay. I didn't ask Dan and Darlene if I could show this photograph, but there's a photograph that I took of them last year in Arizona, and it shows the picture of the poster with the, uh, it's possible that you can purchase these post-it notes that are in the shape of a leaf. So it turned out perfectly for the poster, and this is just an example of a, um, of a poster and a display uh, with your citizen science books. So I uh, thought I would show that before we actually turn it over to Pietro. Great, and, thank you. Okay, and now, it's, uh, and now it's time for Pietro. Let's see. Okay, so I'm just wondering if, if I can purchase a, a a postcard of that photo of <laughs> yeah. um, I want to have that on my wall that's a, that's great so um, yeah thanks for the the great introduction to stall catchers Dan uh, my name is Pietro Michelucci I lead the Human Computation Institute uh, which is basically a, a research institute that that studies uh, and and build supercomputers made out of humans and machines connected by the internet and um, and so uh, we started the Eyes on Owls project uh, uh, with support from Bright Focus Foundation as one such initiative. And and through that project, uh, we created a game called Stall Catchers. Um, so um, before uh, before I tell you anything more about the Megathon or Stall Catchers, I wonder, uh, Marco, if you could play that video um, that we set up, if that's available. If not, we can hold it till the end if it's not ready. Pietro, would you be able to drag the presenter ball back to Marco? Oh, sure. I don't, I, okay. I'm I just thinking. grab it, but I okay. grab it back, so I'm going to go ahead and share that file with you all. So thanks for thanks for watching that uh, or listening to it. That was uh, if if you're just on the phone, that was a video clip from uh, from one team's uh, video feed during uh, during an international event uh, that we do every year called the Catchathon. And uh, in the Catchathon, um, we have teams from all six continents um, uh, from many different countries uh, all participating. That was a team from from Lithuania um, and uh, and. And as you can see, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of excitement during this very intense one hour period of of playing uh, playing the stall catchers game. Um, so this is the first year that we're uh, that we're going to bring this kind of event to Citizen Science Day, and um, and and so. Uh, because we, we like to outdo ourselves with each new event, we're going big. So instead of calling it a catchathon, it's going to be a megathon. And, uh, and our goal in this event um, is going to be to enlist 100,000 participants all during the exact same hour of the same day to play stall catchers and to analyze an entire data set to answer a single research question 
um, in one hour that would take scientists six months to a year to answer in the lab. Um, so we've previously, in, in some of these uh, um, kind of high intensity events, we've uh, we've managed to accomplish uh, several weeks of research in one hour. This time we want to accomplish an entire year's worth of research. And uh, and because of the, the scaling and the power of the crowd uh, with, with enough participants uh, actively engaged, uh, we think we can do this. So, um, so now I will back up and tell you uh, a little bit more about what Stallcatchers is. So um, Stall Catchers is uh, an online game that anyone can play. And by playing the game, uh, you help to speed up Alzheimer's research by analyzing real research data. Um, and, um, and so uh, this is what it looks like to play the game on a, on a tablet. Uh, it can be played on a, on a smartphone, on a tablet, uh, on, on a laptop, uh, any internet connected device. And, um, and the basic idea in the game is um, is to make a uh, is to answer a simple question. So we draw a little outline. I don't know if you can see this orange outline around a blood vessel in the brain of a mouse, and that mouse might or might not have Alzheimer's disease, and it might or might not have been given a drug compound that could be a treatment for Alzheimer's disease. And then we're trying to look at the blood vessel inside that outline and decide if the blood is flowing or stalled in that vessel. And I'll explain why we care about that in a minute. Um, so, as I mentioned, uh, people who play the game are not being studied. Uh, we're not collecting data on participants to, to determine whether or not they have Alzheimer's disease. People who play, you know, in the spirit of citizen science are uh, doing some of the work of scientists and analyzing uh, this research data um, that would otherwise take a very long time for the scientists to analyze on their own. So by turning it into a game and making it into kind of a fun activity and sometimes a competitive activity, uh, we get uh, a lot of work done in a much uh, shorter period of time. Um, so, um, so why do we care about looking at these little blood vessels? Um, We've known since the beginning of Alzheimer's disease that there's 30% less blood flow in the brain of an Alzheimer's patient uh, than in a healthy brain. But we've never understood why until very recently. So uh, my institute works uh, closely with Cornell University and in particular their, their biomedical engineering department where uh, some scientists there discovered that, um, uh, that the source of this reduced blood flow is stalled capillaries in the brain. So in other words, these very tiny blood vessels in the brain actually stop flowing. Um, and when you compare healthy mice to mice who, that have been given the, uh, the human version of Alzheimer's disease and manifest all the cognitive symptoms of the disease and the hallmark uh, amyloid plaques uh, that, that you see post-mortem, those mice have a much higher rate of stalled capillaries than the healthy mice. And, and what the researchers found um, is that um, when they introduced uh, uh, a compound into these mice with the Alzheimer's um, that released the stalls, that the mice actually got their memory back and their depression went away. Um, the problem is that, um, that the drug they introduced to accomplish that uh, actually compromises the immune system of the mice. And, and it's not a sustainable treatment, it would eventually kill the mouse, and, and if it were given to a human, it would kill the human. So, um, so what we have is sort of a mechanism that can alleviate cognitive symptoms, potentially uh, slow the progression of the disease, but we need to find um, a way to invoke that mechanism that doesn't harm the organism, and that's the purpose of this research track that's supported by stall catchers. So um, when people uh, play stall catchers, they're helping to advance that specific line of research. So the, the, the way this works is that um, the, the scientists, uh, to boil it down, will take a, a compound that potentially makes these stalled uh, vessels start flowing again, and that's hopefully safer, and give it to the mice. And then someone actually has to take a picture of all these blood vessels in the brain. So they take this 3D image of the mouse brain 
and then they send it over to stall catchers. And then we have to go in and actually look at each individual blood vessel and figure out if it's flowing or stalled and count the number of stalls. That's the only way to know if this drug compound is actually making a difference. Um, and so previously, before stall catchers came along, every new uh, compound they wanted to try would take six to 12 months to test. Now, um, with the power of the crowd, uh, we're doing this four to five times faster than in the lab. That means that we can test a new compound every two months or so. And what we're proposing to do in the Megathon, of course, is to test a compound in one hour, uh, which would be completely unprecedented. So again, um, 100,000 people, uh, we want to get a million annotations. So a million sounds like a lot, but if you have 100,000 people playing, that's only 10 per person. And you can do 10. If you're an experienced player, you can do 10 in about five minutes. So um, so I think, you know, even if we don't get a full 100,000 people playing, I think this is um, uh, this is a, a, an achievable goal. And, um, and so at the end of the event, so we'll have every, everyone connected via live stream on video so people can participate from home they can participate as part of a meetup at a, at a library um, and if you're at a library and you have a video feed then we'll pop in and we'll visit you during the event and and you know we like to create this real sense of connectedness so everyone can see everybody playing um, we'll say you know hey where are you what's your library's name and and show the crowd playing the game and and uh, when we've done this with the International Catch-A-Thon, it's just an amazing feeling to know that we're all kind of crossing ideological boundaries and political boundaries and state boundaries and working toward a common goal that transcends all those things because we're all members of the human species and we're all prone to dementia. So, um, so we want to create this experience uh, on a grand scale um, in the Megathon. So, um, so why... Um, you know, why take part in the Megathon? Well, so you, you don't have to, of course, and, and there are lots of other citizen science projects. Uh, this is only gonna be for part of Citizen Science Day, and this is, this is just one uh, opportunity to participate. Um, but we, I think part of the, the, the reason we, we thought to try this is because it's kind of a low-hanging fruit as far as barriers to entry. It's easy to, to, to register for the game. Um, there's an online kind of walk me through that, that sort of just takes your, holds your hand through, through the analysis of 10 blood vessels. And, and at the end, you kind of have your wings and you can play the game. Uh, and you can do that from home or from anywhere. There's a video tutorial to help you. Um, and of course, the, all the reasons for doing citizen science in the first place. You get a chance to participate in real science. Um, in the Megathon, you'll be able to track live how much your, you or your team are contributing um, to the research. Uh, at the end, there will be a real research outcome. We'll have the Cornell scientists on hand to interpret uh, the results of the analysis um, and, uh, and explain to us um, you know, how the, uh, the outcome of, of the Megathon uh, gets us closer to an Alzheimer's treatment to, to say, what, you know, what is the, the, the real substantive impact of this on the research and put it in terms that we can, we can really understand. Um, and uh, we're going to go for a world record. I don't know if, if there's a Guinness category that exactly fits this, but, but certainly uh, if we accomplish this, we will be setting um, a world record uh, in terms of, of uh, you know, biomedical participatory science. So, um, you know, we're very excited about all, all these uh, possibilities. And, um, you know, one, one great aspect uh, of this game is, is that we, we've had, um, you know, children as young as six years old play it. Um, we, one of our uh, super catchers, uh, someone who is, uh, our community calls themselves catchers. And, and one of our super catchers was an 85 year old woman who, whose goal was to always be in the top 20 on the leaderboard. And, and, uh, and she, and she certainly maintained that, that level of play. So, um, so it's intergenerational, uh, anyone can play it. Um, and, uh, and so far it seems like people really, really have fun doing it. Um, so, um, you know, we would encourage you, if you're interested in, in, in potentially bringing this into your library, to actually go to megathon.us and sign up. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's basically a simple registration page. You put in your email address, you put in a username, um, and you'll not only get signed up for stall catchers um, 
and um, and get an email with with links about with more information about the Megathon, but you will also get signed up on SciStarter. So it's kind of a, a quick and easy way to to get into this loop and um, and and to you know be uh, uh, stay informed about what's going on in addition to um, you know this this weekly uh, uh, librarian uh, uh, working group uh, meeting that we have. Um, and then the only other uh, thing that I thought I would mention is uh, if you do sign up. Um, that um, you explore the team creation feature because what you can do is actually go in and create a team for your library that's named after your library. You can put your library logo on it, or you can put you know Donald Duck on it. You can put whatever you want, and um, and then you can invite others to join that team, either either library pa patrons or colleagues. Um, and uh, and we're going to start. Um, I'm I'm announcing this for the first time here and now. Uh, starting tomorrow, we're going to have a Thursday league night. Um, so we actually have a league mechanism. And when you create a team, there's this opportunity to join your team to a league. Um, and uh, I think someone just added it to the chat. It'll be every Thursday night from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Pacific time, uh, which is a bit late for the East Coasters, 10 p.m. to midnight. Um, but if, if you're up for it, come and play stall catchers during that time on a team, um, and, uh, and then you'll be part of a, a, a kind of a challenge leaderboard, uh, which you'll be able to see right in the, in the main interface, and, and you can compete against other library teams. And I think it's a great way to kind of get used to the game and warm up uh, for the Megathon. And by the time the Megathon rolls around, you may have aggregated kind of a community uh, of players on your team, and some of those people might want to show up and be part of your local meetup, and, and others might want to play from home. Um, but it's a very flexible system, and, um, and, and if you need any help, uh, if you have any questions about it, please feel free to reach out uh, to us, and, and there are mechanisms in the interface to, to, that explain how to do that. So um, please go to megathon.us and, and register, and uh, I hope you'll give it a try. And, uh, and of course, I'm happy to answer any questions. And I think I'm now going to turn it back over. Uh, I have to drag this little ball over to Darlene. Okay. Thank you. Peter, that was great. Thank you so much. And you can see this next slide is just a reminder that every Wednesday, except this one, at four o'clock Eastern time. Um, Caroline Nickerson, who you can see um, adding some messages and chat there, um, and Pietro host an open weekly call. It's especially, um, I think, helpful for librarians if you're thinking about um, getting involved in Citizen Science Day. I think these are very helpful. Um, it's a good opportunity to ask any questions that you might have. And in fact, your questions are used to create an FAQ. So it's a, it's a really good opportunity to learn about Citizen Science Day, understand how to get involved, reminders of how to access some of the resources we're about to show you online here, and um, in particular, there's great support for hosting a megathon. Okay, let's see here if I could get to the next slide. So now we're going to spend a couple um, minutes just talking about some of the resources available to you as librarians. And Dan had mentioned earlier that SciStarter has um, more than 3,000 citizen science projects and events from all different types of science disciplines. Basically what we say is if you are curious or concerned, there's a project in need of your help. And remember, all of these projects aim to advance areas of scientific research. So 3,000 projects that can be done almost anywhere by anyone, any time of year. The way to use um, SciStarter is to use project finder and there's a couple of different ways to use it you can use the mini project finder which is on the home page and that's scistarter.org and there you can click that little orange triangle there that says find a location and that will pick up your um, location of where you are your um, exactly where you are and then you can have the option of also selecting a relevant topic and then you click find project and you'll find all the things in your area the other way is to use an advanced search option and this way you can select the appropriate audience. So you might be looking for projects that are great for um, senior citizens or relevant for families or young children. 
you can find them that way. If you're um, working with educators, there's a way to look for projects that have classroom materials. Another thing we have there is where you see all activities. That's kind of a neat one because you can um, search for projects that can be done in various settings, on a hike, um, while fishing, things like that. Um, and then, of course, you can enter a word or a phrase. This I would recommend if you're looking for projects that go along with programs that you already have in place or, or themes that you have coming up with summer reading time, for example. Just type in the word that you're looking for. Maybe that's, maybe that's space exploration. And you'll find all the projects that can be done related to that topic. You can also embed the project finder on your website. And all of this is, is free thanks to the National Science Foundation. You can embed the project finder on your website using some of the tools. We make it easy for you to find those tools as well, but probably the easiest thing is to look at the links that are in the footer of SciStarter.org. There's um, you know, information and instructions on how to embed the project finder on your site, for example. And you can make them look like your website. So it doesn't have to say SciStarter, it doesn't have to use our colors or our font. You can select the types of projects that you want to show up on your own project finder. PBS uses it um, with a show called Side Girls to enable girls to find projects that can be done in the United States that are active and that are relevant to their age group. Just more examples of how others use the um, project finder. And actually, there's the URL there at the bottom. It's an example of how Side Girls uses it. So you can see you can just customize it as you see fit. Um, here's the links to resources and projects that we've talked about um, during this during this presentation as well as links to the kits that I showed you earlier. Um, those kits were designed so that they could be, um, there's a build, borrow, buy option for those kits in case you wanted to get them into your own library. And I would recommend as one of your next steps is to not hesitate to reach out to us at SciStarter. And that, that includes Dan, Caroline, and myself. And we can help you access these resources. We can help you um, from a technical standpoint if you have any questions about digitally embedding any of these codes. You need help customizing some of the posters. And I think you're really going to love the new posters that we're going to post on the site on Friday. They're just, they're beautiful. Posters and the bookmarks and um, buttons and flyers and um, a wonderful librarian's guide to citizen science. Um, all those things, if you're looking for help to just customize those, we can help there. When you come up with an event, or if you already have an event, um, certainly register on the Megathon site, if you're doing a Megathon, and then be sure to add your event to SciStarter. And it's all at the SciStarter.org um, slash citizen hyphen science hyphen day site. You'll see how you can add your event there. And that way, people can find it. And we'll help recruit people to, to show up at your event, too. If you need help finding a volunteer to help you organize um, the event, let us know. We have a list of people who have you know, signed up to be what we call ambassadors. So these are people who would help go to your library, um, you know, kind of do a test run the day or two before, make sure that you have enough computers, that, you have, that the Wi-Fi is working. Um, be there to answer questions about the Megathon and stall catchers the day of. So take us up on that. Happy to help find that, especially Caroline. Her email is listed there in the chat. Again, we can help you recruit participants for this. Um, help you through how to host the Megathon and, in general, help you continue to sustain citizen science in your library. And there's lots and lots of different ways to do that. Um, and I think that might be our last slide, other than to thank again NNLM and Kelly in particular for her support of this work. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that we might have some time here for some Q&A. Kelly, would that be okay? Yes, we have uh, 20 minutes left, so we have plenty of time for Q&A. And I would first like to just thank all of our presenters. This is so exciting, and it's, it's fun to see some of the different possibilities. I want to mention to everyone the slides are going to be available probably by 
Friday on the link that uh, Marco put in the chat. And we'll all, all of the the resources that are on those slides, you'll be able to access them, you know, just by pulling pulling down the slides and having those links. Uh, so, are, if there are questions, you can either put them in the chat. Uh, I'm not sure if you'll be able to unmute yourself or not. We that I'm not sure if we can do or not. But uh, please do put your questions in the chat box. And so Marco, are we able to, um, uh, are people able to unmute themselves if they have a question? Um, they can raise their hands and I can unmute them. Unfortunately, if I unmute everybody, you'll hear a lot of noise. Oh, okay. Okay, so if you want to um, raise your hand as a, if you have a question or just put it in the chat and then we can uh, answer your questions that way. I do want to mention a few things too. The National Network of Libraries of Medicine, so that would be nnlm.gov. We are a regional network and all of the different regions around the country uh, will also be good support resources for you. So if you are interested in exploring ideas for programs, if you're interested in applying for funding, uh, there there may be opportunities for you coming up for citizen science projects in your own region. If you need to know how to find uh, your region, you, I'll put the, the link in the chat. When you go to the nnlm.gov website, you would then click on uh, your individual region. You can pull up the map, uh, the regional map, and see where you're located, and then that would take you to the contact information for your own region. So let's see. We do have a couple of entries in the chat box. Yep. So I, I see a, a, a question from, uh, looks like, uh, Thea Hart. Um, who says, uh, I've been trying to play stall catchers and I'm finding it kind of tricky. I keep getting things wrong during the test drive. It seems ideal to have some practice before the megathon and do you have any suggestions for making sure everyone practices before coming um, to the Citizen Science Megathon if we were to host one at our library? So I think that's a, a great question and I, I think it raises a, a really key point about stall catchers. So um, one of the things that we do in stall catchers is um, because we need very high quality data, we take the same vessel and we show it to several different people and we combine answers for many different people. So if one person happens to get it wrong one time and another person gets it wrong the other time, we validated our methods so we know with the confidence that we need that no matter how many mistakes any individual makes, um, that the system is going to self-calibrate and give us very high quality results. So it's perfectly fine to make mistakes. Everyone, may, I make mistakes. My, my colleagues tease me because I'm, I'm not a very good catcher. Um, <laughs> I, but, and and uh, some people find it easier than others. But I think, um, I think the, so, so it's, it's fine to make mistakes and, and, and that might not ever entirely go away. Um, but I think the value in practicing is just um, getting familiar with the game itself so you know how to play it and you don't have to figure out, okay, how do I register? Um, you know, how do I see how I'm doing in the game on the day of the megathon? And, and I think if the question is, you know, how do you um, encourage people to practice? Um, I think that's the idea behind these these Thursday night league challenges that we're going to hold. So anyone who, um, if if you create a team in stall catchers for your library and you you join your team to that league, which is right on the team creation page. Basically, there's your team name, your team logo, and then you pick what league you want to be in if you want to be in a league. So you pick the league. And then anyone who joins your team is automatically going to be participating um, and showing up in the leaderboards for that challenge. Um, so it's it's every Thursday night. Um, I think it was uh, I think that the the time was 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Pacific time. 
And um, you don't have to play during that time. You could hold practice meetups anytime you want. But um, but that's a way to sort of be involved in sort of a, a, a mini competition that gets people a sense of, oh, this is what it's going to be like to do the megathon. And also, Pietro, I think that's what that first hour is for, or the first half hour, correct, of the, of the actual megathon is to get people onboarded and trained so they feel pretty comfortable. That's right. I mean, I, I think if you start with 100 people in a room who have who have never seen the game before, then getting them all ramped up in a half hour, uh, you might end up with a few stragglers, and, and that's not a big deal. I'm, so, I mean, we've we've run, you know, international catch-a-thons where people, have, where, where most of the people have shown up for the first time on the day of, and, and sometimes people are kind of getting the hang of it halfway through, and that's okay. They're still participating, and by the end of it, they've made a, a substantial contribution. Um, so, yeah, I don't think it, it's it's not a requirement to have done it before, but I think it, it does kind of ease some of that that day of okay. burden. So that that's one, one answer there is that um, maybe it's not the end all, but you're – the um, this megathon starts a half hour before we actually start clocking that participation, and that is designed to just onboard people too and give give some practices there. Um, Pietro, um, what kind of devices can you play the game on? Yep, so it can be played on any internet connected device, uh, laptop, tablet, or smartphone. Um, for me, smart the smartphone is is a little small to to try to look at those blood vessels, so I prefer either a tablet or a laptop. Um, great question. I think this one is probably for, for band. And this question is, do we plan to develop different resources dedicated to research libraries and to public libraries? The former may be interested in the scientific outcomes, while the latter could be interested in the learning outcomes of citizen science. Yeah, so um, in terms of uh, what we're doing, we're we are kind of expanding now uh, on all fronts. Um, at Arizona State University, we have a, a, a group of faculty members and grad students uh, who are interested in doing research uh, with citizen science. And so right now we're, we're kind of exposing them to the public library side uh, to let them know that, you know, you, you have these, um, these community centers willing and able to assist in collecting your data um, that, that are, are reliable and, and available there. So we're we're trying to match them those up together. Um, and as we had mentioned, uh, I think uh, on one of Darlene's earlier slides, um, North Carolina State University um, has a a public science faculty cluster um, that does research um, of which citizen science is a, is a big part of that. And the library at North Carolina State University works uh, with them as well to host uh, campus-wide uh, citizen science project each spring. So uh, they're developing um, projects like that that you know are, are certainly um, open to you know being being shared and modeled um, at other uh, universities as well. And there are also um, a lot of citizen scientists out there uh, who aren't affiliated with libraries but are uh, in communities, uh, in local government, in local um, educational um, organizations. Uh, in state and local parks, um, and so all of these folks are are looking for ways to do this, and and you know the the partnership opportunities um, are there, and and we're we're trying to uh, again to to get these people to to come together. Great, thank you. Uh, lots of questions here about I guess pretty much capacity of um, participants to internet bandwidth. And and I can't tell actually Pietro and is it Megan or Robin, if you're saying the same thing or if you are saying two different things. Um, 
I see a note from Robin here that keeps dropping down. Uh, let's see. Is it I five? think we're saying slightly different things. Okay, so, so let's, let's clarify because this question comes up a lot. Yep, yep, you bet. So, so I, I think um, if I remember right, because I, I think uh, you know, Robin, we we talked about this a bit. Um, so she did some some real world testing, which is great, and found that if you're using a hotspot, that is, if someone brings their smartphone in and they they open up their hotspot to a few other people in the room, that they could actually have five people playing off the same cell phone connection to the internet. Um, so that's I think that's separate from using Wi-Fi. That's if if you're trying to sort of uh, divide and conquer. You know, if you have a room full of 100 people and, you, and you're afraid your Wi-Fi won't handle everyone, then you could ask people to to set up some some of their own you know personal hotspots. Um, but with a Wi-Fi connection, um, you know, we think that that um, you know just kind of and this is you know theory and practice aren't always exactly the same. But in theory. Um, you know, streaming one YouTube video uses about the same bandwidth as uh, 10 people playing stall catchers. Uh, the stall catch, each time you look at a new blood vessel, it's loading um, a very short video, and then you kind of, you examine that video. So, um, and it, and, and people tend to take about 30 seconds per turn. So based on that, um, you know, we think that most you know, library Wi-Fi's would accommodate a, a normal sized classroom of people playing. Okay. Um, do participants in the Megathon need to have an account? Um, yeah, you, you need to be signed up in stall catchers. Um, you don't have to you don't have to specifically say, uh, you know, join me to the Megathon. There as long as you're playing stall catchers, um, at that moment on that day, you're going to be participating in the megathon, and and it doesn't matter whether you registered a month ahead or you registered for stall catchers at that moment. Pietro, would it help to show the the website? Is there anything that you'd like to show? We can either have you share your screen, or I could do it, and you could walk me through where you'd like people to see. Yeah, why, if if you don't mind, could could you do it, and I'll walk you through it because that way we sign up one more person. <laughs> Sure. So um, let's see. Let me see if I can share my screen. Okay. Are you able to see that? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Tell me. Tell me what you'd like me to show. Okay, so um, the first thing I want to point out before you put in any information is you can see it says join the Megathon, and then there's this little text next to it that says, what is it? Well, so if you come here and you say, well, I don't really completely get what this is yet, click on that, go ahead and do that, and it'll scroll you down to the bottom of the screen and uh, give you kind of an overview, what the goals are, and then there are some links here with more resources, a librarian's guide, a teacher's guide, someone who just wants to organize a meetup at a Starbucks, um, for anyone who just wants to participate as individuals. So um, yeah. lots of options there. I'd like to show what the uh, For Librarians link looks like just so um, people can see what they will find when they come here. So lots of great information specifically for librarians, but if you're also working with, uh, if you have a partnership with your school, you know, be sure to let them know that this is happening, and maybe you can have have a joint team or something like that. So now I'll go back and uh, some of the other okay. other links. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's great. And uh, yeah, and speaking of schools, it sounded like um, one of our la recent calls, someone was thinking of opening up their school on a Saturday uh, to, to host the students for for this. Um, so yeah, why don't we go ahead and have you sign up. So go ahead and make up a username. Um, you can, you can uh, be incognito or, or there you go, Kelly Ketcher. Uh, that's great. And then um, so now I might, I, I'm not sure if I uh, have used my my work email address or not, but I'll, I'll try it. Okay. I may already be signed up. And, and then, then I, yeah, then depending on which one of these, you can click more than one option. So you can be a librarian, you can be a student, uh, you can be, uh, if you're already playing stall catchers, um, then 
you can click that and it, and it lets us know to, that, that you want to get information about the Megathon, but you're already registered in Stall Catchers. Okay. Uh, uh, for purposes of this, should I uncheck that? Yeah, go ahead and uncheck it. We'll see what happens. Okay. And then sign up. And then you're going to get signed up for Stall Catchers um, for SciStarter, and you'll get information about the Megathon. Now you can click Get Back to Stall Catchers. So that tells me that it sort of recognized that you might already be a stall catcher player. And um, okay, so I'm, I, I thought it would kick you right into the game. Um, so why don't you go ahead and try to log in then okay. if, you, if you have an existing account um, okay. on stall catchers. If you were doing it for the first time, you would have automatically started playing the game. But I think because you're a, a pre-existing user, then you just need to, to log in. I'll see if this works. Okay. I should have done this beforehand to make sure that I could get in. Okay, hey, there we are. Looks like you're in. Excellent. So you can see there's this online, this real-time chat on the right side, and um, we have some of our frequent players bantering with each other there. Anyone can can chat on there. Although for um, for school school classrooms, we're going to limit it so they can only talk. The students can only talk to each other just to protect minors. So if you want to, to minimize that chat box, it'll be easier to see the, the game itself. Um, and uh, right, so now you're, you're already playing the game. It looks like you already did that initial walkthrough where it guides you step by step through some different examples. Mm -hmm. um, so now you would just take that green dot and scroll it back and forth. And, um, and then you can sort of See, there's a, a blood vessel inside that orange outline. Sometimes you'll see more than one, but it's the one that follows the shape of the outline that you're concerned with. And then you're trying to decide whether blood is flowing through that vessel. So the liquid part is, is, is bright white because there's something in it to make it light up. And then the black spots are red blood vessels, or, or I'm sorry, red blood cells. Okay, so, so in this one, do you, uh, well, I'm not sure because when I get to a, a particular point, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the black part that we're yeah. seeing right at the top of that, I'm yeah. wondering if that's a stall. Yeah, that, that would definitely be my guess, but I've been wrong before. Okay, so, so I'm going yeah. to click stalled, and then, then I click right where I think the stall is. So I'm going yep. to click click that. We'll see what happens. Nothing happened. Yeah, it says correct. Oh, okay, correct. Okay, 846 points, yay. <laughs> oh, that's, that's quite a lot of points for, for one. So this is what happens in the game. As you get better at the game, that blue bar on the right, you see there's that little eye symbol and then a mm -hmm. blue bar above it. That's a sensitivity bar, and it's kind of a measure of, of your ability to discriminate between flowing installed vessels. And the bigger that bar is, the more points you get for a correct answer. Um, Great. So that's your incentive. And it looks okay, like you so. you've previously answered about some vessels where we didn't know the answer yet. Um, and so you can redeem points for, for vessels by clicking that green button. You can get points for vessels you annotated in a previous session where we didn't know if you were right or wrong until we collected enough answers from other people. Great, great. So I do see that we're we're right up at the end of our session. So we should probably um, wrap up the final final bits now. Let's see. I need to go back to our. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And now we're back at the uh, at our presentation. So, uh, Darlene or Dan or Pietro, do you have any final final words you'd like to say? Just to thank everybody for turning out for this webinar and to definitely take us up on it if you have any questions about citizen science or the Megathon or Citizen Science Day. And yeah, thanks be, everyone. Yeah, thank you so much to all of our presenters and we're looking forward to having as many libraries as possible sign up for the Megathon and participate in Citizen Science Day 2019. Be sure to contact your NNLM regional office if you have additional questions or, or would like more information about funding for projects uh, and ways in which um, our, our offices can support you. 
And thanks again to all of our presenters. Uh, we will be collecting the, the information in the chat box and um, providing all of those links to you. Um, if for all of the people who registered, you'll be getting a reminder of the recording, I believe, but you can also go to that link for the recording uh, later on and get the PowerPoint slides. Okay, so I think we'll go ahead and, and stop the recording now. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate it so Thanks, much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Okay, thank you.